Good afternoon, everybody. It's good afternoon here in Europe. Uh, good morning to those of you in the US and uh, good evening to those of you in the Far East. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the latest uh, International Menopause Society webinar entitled Clinician Readiness for New Therapies for Vasomotor Symptoms. We have two fantastic speakers with us this afternoon who are going to give you the latest information. What I'm going to do initially is just to introduce each speaker in turn. We'll have their presentations. And then at the end of that, we will have a Q&A session. Please put your questions in the chat, um, in, in the Q&A function, sorry. And we will then pick them up after the two presentations. So uh, our two speakers are Richard Anderson and Julia Prague. I'll introduce them both in turn. But I would like to also just thank Bessans Healthcare for their support. This uh, webinar is supported by an unrestricted educational grant from them, but they have no role in the selection of the topics or the content. So I'd just like to thank them for their contribution. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Richard Anderson. Professor Richard Anderson is Professor of Clinical Reproductive Science at University of Edinburgh, and he works clinically in infertility and reproductive endocrinology. His research includes investigating the female reproductive lifespan, and he has conducted many clinical studies developing our understanding of novel neuropeptides in human reproductive function in men and women. So, Professor Anson, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Tim. So, yeah, thanks very much um, for the kind words and also to the uh, Society for the opportunity to discuss this fascinating topic with you uh, today. So my role here is to give you a bit of a background into the physiology of this and then Julia will lead into the clinical trials that are going on now and in the future with this. I think a really exciting development um, in this field for relevance for this, um, this society. So I've had some disclosures. I've worked with some of the companies who are involved in this field. So this audience really doesn't need to be reminded of the severity and importance of vasomotor symptoms in menopausal women. Um, they are enormously prevalent. They are hugely uh, impactful on health, health services for the number of um, uh, medical interventions and prescriptions that are used. And although we've had effective hormone therapy for a long time, there really is an unmet need for non-hormonal therapy um, uh, with the current methods of non-hormonal therapy really being very ineffective and barely better than placebo. And many women, of course, either don't want to or can't take uh, uh, hormone therapy, for example, most commonly after breast cancer. But I think it's also important to remember that these are also male symptoms, for example, in men who are suffering from um, hormone deprivation for treatment of breast cancer. And, and this whole approach is in fact a nice unisex approach to the treatment of hot flashes. Uh, they can be debilitating, they last a long time, uh, they occur particularly during the day but also almost as prevalently as night and I think the therapies that Julia is going to be discussing with you discuss how this nighttime um, effect can be just as beneficial as the daytime um, benefit from this. But my remit really is to give you the sort of um, scientific background to why this is such an, an in interesting and innovative area. And actually, it's got a whole bunch of strands that come together, some of which which have actually been in the scientific literature for actually several decades. And so it's really intriguing just to see how this has really come together in the last few years into this exciting therapy. So what I'm going to talk to you about, or largely been asked to talk to you about, is these candy neurons. And the K in that stands for kispeptin. Now, these are now recognized to be the neurons in the hypothalamus that are the key drivers of gonadotropin releasing hormone secretion, which is, of course, the absolute driver of reproductive function in men and women. And as a wee point of note, actually, this year celebrates the 50th anniversary of the discovery of GNRH. So a, a nice wee a happy birthday there. And these candy neurons are actually, the kispeptin neurons are also the site of sex steroid feedback, both positive and negative. And that's very relevant, of course, to the hormone deprivation that occurs particularly after the menopause. And as I say, also in men on androgen withdrawal therapy. Now, this is one of these wonderful scenarios of uh, clinical uh, serendipity, re picking up um, index cases and then going through the whole molecular biology and finding a whole new pathway. And I remember actually when this first study came out, 
um, in 2003, how what sort of, you know, it was one of those sort of lights turning on moments where you suddenly see how a real big advance has been made and is going to revolutionize how we think about the, in this case, the control of human reproductive function. And what this was, was a family in France where uh, a number of the children, you can see remarkably five of the seven children failed to go through puberty and had hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And what was identified was that they had mutations in this receptor called GPR54 at the time. And this is now known as the Kispeptin receptor. And that led to an explosion of research in this, really just identifying how this Kispeptin pathway in the hypothalamus was a key driver of reproductive function. And these neurons uh, are shown in this immunohistochemistry here in the black. These impinge directly on the GnRH neurons in the hypothalamus in the median eminence and therefore directly control the amount and timing of GnRH secretion that then stimulates the pituitary glands. So in fact, just before that study that I just showed you was published a couple of years prior to that, actually what had been already identified that's of relevance to our topic today is the increase in the activity of this pathway after the menopause. And this is uh, in situ hybridization, so it's looking for kispeptin messenger RNA in individual nuclei in the human hypothalamus. Oops, sorry. And you can see here, this is a, a menopausal uh, hypothalamus is a control. And you can see here the, the larger cell and the greatly increased density of the grains, which are the amount of RNA effectively in this cell. And here's a, a cartoon um, a schematic showing this increase in the infodibular nucleus, which is this key area for where these candy neurons uh, originate. Now, just hold that thought because the next thing that sort of slightly complicates thing that's but, but is essential for today's topic is as well as the kispeptin story coming along as a key regulator of human reproduction shortly thereafter six years later in 2009 so did the neurokinin system and again this was clinical case reports leading to molecular genetics so in this case in turkey families were identified where again uh, siblings had gone through, uh, failed to go through puberty due to hypogonadotrophic hypogonism. And this was found to be due to mutations in either this gene, which includes uh, neurokinin B, or this one, TAC3R, um, which is the neurokinin 3 receptor. So the key ligand and receptor pathway, absolutely essential for reproduction, just like the Kispeptin system. So we then had two pathways that are absolutely key to this. And in fact, what subsequently emerged were not only were they both important, but they were actually localized in the same cellular system. So and that's hence the, the candy neuron, because it contains not just kispeptin, but also neurokinin, the N, and dynorphin, the opioid, as the, as the uh, DY. And they respectively stimulate or inhibit activity of the, neuro, of the kispeptin neurons impinging on the GnRH neuron. And so it's like an autocrine feedback pathway within those neurons impinging on GnRH. And as I say, these are the site of feedback of both of sex steroids. So how does that, what, what else do we know? Well, actually we can go back um, again now 30 years remarkably to the demonstration before any of these pathways were really discovered in their reproductive context that uh, Naomi Ranson colleagues had demonstrated that there was increased neurokinin signaling in the human hypothalamus after the menopause. Very similar to those pictures I showed you with kispeptin, but you can see here uh, in situ hybridization of, kisp of neurokinin message in these cells, just like uh, these kisp kispeptin ones. And of course, you can then start to pull the picture together that these cells signaling through these two pathways have been hypertrophied uh, in the state of estrogen deficiency. Now, if you go back to your medical school days, you because I, I don't think this is something we see very often, but you remember uh, carcinoid tumours, one of the cardinal symptoms of a carcinoid tumour is hot flushes. And this, you see here, these references, they date back to the 1980s, showing the importance of tachykinins, um, which include the neurokinins and substance P, as mediators of these hot flushes. And indeed, pharmacologically, it had been demonstrated that substance P was one of these neuro, uh, tachykinins that could directly induce hot flushes. Linking this with what I've just been talking to you about, 
actually uh, colleagues from, um, from Julia's old group in Imperial had also demonstrated that neurokinin B itself actually induced hot flushes in premenopausal women. And this was a study where they were looking to see if there were reproductive hormone changes from infusion of neurokinin B. And actually what they discovered was this very dramatic and rapid onset of these hot flush-like symptoms in these premenopausal women. And you can see eight of the 10 women, almost as soon as the drug started being administered, reported these symptoms. And as you can see, didn't occur during the vehicle or during the time between the infusions. So this all led together to putting this, this story together with this very important paper, again from Naomi Rance, um, putting together this hypothesis that these kispeptin, neurokinin, dynorphin neurons in the hypothalamus were key mediators of hot flushes in menopausal women. And that really sort of, as I say, has put together the story that I've told you so far. Linking this was actually some more old data, this time from Bob Casper, going back to 1979. And actually, I think Bob tells me this was the first clinical research paper he ever published. And what he demonstrated was that in some women, their hot flushes coincided with LH pulses. Now, you can't measure GnRH in humans intact, um, so, but LH is a very, very good um, substitute for GnRH because each pulse of GnRH that comes down those portal vessels and hits the pituitary results in a pulse of LH. So well, you're really looking indirectly at GnRH pulses here. So this system is firing faster in menopausal women, and it's giving you the characteristic high gonadotropins that we recognize and synchronously get linking somehow to these hot flushes. Now, this has been replicated more recently. This is a study from Anne Oakley relatively recently, um, confirming this coincidence using um, more accurate rather than self-reported, this is using skin conductance rather than self-reported hot flushes, but showing the same thing. And actually this is an interesting study because it was looking at whether you could use uh, an opioid to suppress hot flushes in keeping with the pathway that I've shown you, although it wasn't uh, terribly successful. Further support comes from modern high-tech genetic studies. And, and this is an analysis of uh, 17 and a half thousand women who had GWAS genome-wide association studies between uh, genome sequencing and uh, various outcomes relating to women's health. Um, and they were concentrating this analysis on hot flushes. And what they demonstrated is actually there were no less than 14 SNPs all located in the tachykinin-3, the neurokinin-3 receptor locus that were associated with variation in hot flushes. So we have not only a pathway linking these, we have perhaps the beginnings of some understanding of why the experience of hot flushes varies a lot between women, both in the extent and the duration, and potentially uh, with implications for therapy thereafter. There's actually a, a whole bunch of fantastic um, uh, animal experiments that underpin this field these days as well that are really lovely. Uh, and this is, is a particularly nice study using very clever um, optogenetic stimulation where in a, a rodent model, they labeled these, uh, this is the arcuate nucleus is the equivalent nucleus um, to the infundibula in the, in the rodent model. And they labeled these kispeptin neurons here and they demonstrated that if they activated them, then they induced hot flushes and actually it occurred both in males and female mice, just the same. And you can see here's a, a mouse having a rather nasty hot flush um, compared to the control. And what they demonstrated was that this was sensitized by Eastern deficiency. And they were able to demonstrate pharmacologically that by blocking neurokinin B signaling, then they didn't get the hot flush. And so therefore, you know, here's the mouse with a blue tail here, keeping nice and cool in the presence of this neurokinin antagonism. The pharmacology is slightly more complicated in rodents compared to humans, actually, because it seems that you really need to block all three receptor pathways. Um, so that includes substance P signaling to get a really good pharmacological blockade, whereas the data Julia is going to show you suggests that actually it is predominantly the uh, NK3 receptor that is the relevant one in humans. And that actually also applies to GnRH secretion as well. Um, so it seems like an important species difference there. So this is the sort of model, therefore, that we can look to to put this together. So we have these um, 
and nuclei in the infundibular nucleus in the humans, arcuate in rodents, but expressing kispeptin, uh, expressing down to these GnRH neurons, impinging on that and driving this lovely pulsatile secretion of GnRH that translates into this pulsatile secretion of LH. Uh, FSH, of course, not so pulsatile, but of course, both important for reproductive function. And then you have these feedback loops, the neurokinin pathways driving this positively, the dynorphin pathway, the opioid pathway, inhibiting it to provide um, perhaps the basis uh, to some extent of the pulsatility mechanism there. And this projection through to these warm sensing neurons in the median preoptic nucleus, which use the neurokinin pathway um, in humans, neurokinin B, NK3R, and that drives the hot flushes that we uh, recognize. So you can see how using an antagonist, a neurokinin B antagonist, you would prevent that stimulation and suppress that. And I, and I haven't shown you all the reproductive data because we've really concentrated on the hot flushes here, but if you administer a neurokinin antagonist to either men or women, you will quite markedly suppress GnRH and LH secretion and gonadal function. So quite dramatic drops in testosterone levels down to about 50%, even after a single dose of these drugs in normal men. And so you have an activity you can block there and you can have an act that will then suppress this and you can have an activity here that will suppress that as well. And so perhaps one of the key things going forward from this um, prediction from this model is by having these two um, sites of action in series effectively, then that might give you an extra double whammy effect that will translate into the clinical effects that Julia's going to be talking about um, in a minute. So in summary, um, I hope I've shown you that these kispeptin and neurokinin pathways are critical for reproductive function via GnRH secretion. They have potentially widespread therapeutic applications in that, all sorts of things that we haven't really got uh, time or interest to talk about particularly today. But there's also this particularly the neurokinin system, not the, the kispeptin bit of it, the neurokinin bit of it, that's a key mediator of hot flushes leading to the potential for antagonism there in both men and women in, in reducing this very trouble symptom. And I look forward to hearing what Julia has to update us on on the uh, clinical practice here. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Richard. That was a excellent overview of the subject and really sort of very easy to follow and, and made us uh, whetted our appetite for the clinical work that Julia is going to present us now. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Julia Prague, who is a consultant endocrinologist and academic researcher at the University of Exeter and previously at Imperial College London. And she has done a lot of the seminal research on uh, the neurokinin 3 antagonists uh, published in the Lancet, I think 2016, 17, and also got the North American Menopause Society Prize in that year for the that emerging treatment. So uh, Julia, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for the opportunity to um, be involved in um, this today. Okay, so um, Thank you also to um, Richard for that fantastic overview um, and introduction um, to this talk. Um, I have no financial relationships to disclose. So as Richard just explained to us, um, it is the neurokinin B um, within the candy neurons that are particularly critical um, for being implicated in the etiology of hot flushes um, in a sex a steroid uh, deficient state. And obviously for the purposes of today, we're mostly talking about that state being the menopause. Um, but as Richard alluded to, there are other sex steroid uh, deficiency states where flushes are seen. For example, women with estrogen deprivation therapy for breast cancer and men with prostate um, cancer and androgen deprivation therapy. And so as estrogen levels fall in the menopause, you've got increased negative feedback, therefore an increase in neurokinin B, which is then all being heightened signaling sent to the median preoptic nucleus, which interacts with the autonomic thermoregulatory pathway. And it's that therefore that goes on to cause vasomotor symptoms. And so Many of my, um, many of you and um, one of my previous bosses used to always start with, well, why might this be an evolution um, 
uh, kind of benefits? Why, why are we wired up like this? And actually, it's probably because this becomes a pathological remnant of what was previously um, important for fertility. So we know that um, the uh, temperature increases by about 0.1 to 0.3 degrees around the time of ovulation. That's obviously why ovulation um, testing kits work. And it's thought that this is helpful to aid implantation of the blastocyst, um, but also is important as a way that, that the reproductive system can coordinate um, and cross-react with the temperature regulation system to also control temperature in pregnancy, which may be beneficial for the fetus. So obviously in the menopause, once your fertility is lost, um, this therefore um, will become a pathological system um, rather than one that is evolutionary protective. And so for the reasons that um, Richard alluded to, if you've got this increased negative feedback, how can you block that and therefore try to prevent symptoms? And of course, you can therefore block that with a neurokinin-3 receptor antagonist, because this is the receptor that the neurokinin-B is an agonist to. Um, and therefore, this led us and many others to think that if you could give an oral neurokinin-3 receptor antagonist, you should be able to attenuate menopausal hot flushes without the need for estrogen exposure. Because of course, the way that HRT works is at the bottom of the pathway here by further increasing estrogen levels once more and so silencing the additional negative feedback and so therefore reducing levels of neurokinin B that are then being put through to the thermoregulatory system. And so really to take that forward, there have now been at least four phase two placebo controlled clinical trials um, of three actually chemically distinct neurokinin-3 receptor antagonists um, that have now published. And um, as I say, they've used some chemically distinct compounds, albeit within the same drug class, um, but they've also used very different um, methodological approaches. Um, and so that's something to bear in mind when we later discuss some of the results that have been um, shown. Um, as I say, there, there are these four. The first one um, is the kind of incident publication um, and the one that I'll focus on most today, partly because it's the data I'm most familiar with, um, uh, but it's also um, the one that has been published in, in full. Um, Emily 4901 previously called AZD4901 because it was first owned by AstraZeneca and bought subsequently by Melendo Therapeutics. Fezolinatant also um, is the Estelis compound, which is the NK3R antagonist, um, previously owned by Agada, um, but was bought out by them. And NT814 um, is the Candy Therapeutics compound, which is actually a dual neurokinin 1 and neuro neurokinin 3 receptor antagonist um, that has subsequently been bought by Bayer, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So as I said, really to focus on the kind of overall picture of um, what the efficacy data is from the NK3R antagonist class, we will use primarily the data from the study published in The Lancet. So again, I mentioned that point about methodology. So this study was set up to be a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind, two-way crossover, separated by a two-week washout period. And the reason why we, we wanted to design it as such was because we knew that hot flushes are individually experienced. And so we felt it was really important that individuals were their own control within the study. It also meant that the women could have both intervention and placebo, and we also felt that that was important. Um, and it also meant that we could have a shorter trial duration with a smaller number of participants. And so it was set up in this way with a two week washout period because the half life of MLE is approximately eight and a half hours. On the basis of our power calculation, which needed to be an effect of at least twice as good as placebo, we knew that we needed 30 healthy women to allow for a 10% dropout rate. The participants were aged between 40 and 62. They had to be amenorrheic for at least 12 months and having at least seven hot flushes in a 24 hour period of which some had to be at least severe or bothersome. And this was an investigator initiated and an investigator led study. It was funded by the MRC and it was in collaboration with Imperial College, AstraZeneca and latterly Melendo Therapeutics and the NIHR. 
and ethics were um, approved by the West London Regional Ethical Committee. So our study population, 37 women were randomized and received placebo and or Emily for 901. And so this was our intention to treat cohort. We chose our a priori, a priori, we chose our statistical analysis plan, and this was published for the main outcomes of interest. And then subsequently, we did some post hoc analysis to establish the therapeutic profile and time course of MLE for 901, but using the same approaches that we had already defined a priori. Our population had a mean age of 55 years, the mean BMI was 25.8, and 75% were Caucasian because this was a, a study based in London. The mean total number of flushes per week was 85, with a mean total number therefore per 24 hour period of 13. And remember to be an, included in the study, which was confirmed at the end of a two week, wash out, uh, a two -week run in period, um, some of these um, hot flushes needed to be counted as severe or bothersome. So we achieved our primary outcome. MLE for 901 significantly reduced the total weekly number of hot flushes compared to placebo in the fourth week of treatment. But we also wanted to look at how this had changed from baseline. And so to ensure statistical efficiency, we looked at full change from the baseline and were able to show that after four weeks of treatment, MLE for 901 reduced hot flush frequency by 73%. We also saw about a 28% reduction in hot flush frequency with placebo, which is very similar to the 25% improvement in hot flushes with placebo reported in the pre-existing literature. In the postdoc analysis, we started to look at um, what the treatment effect was at day three versus week four, and we were able to see a very similar reduction in the hot flush frequency as early, day, as, early as day three as at four weeks. So these are obviously impacting extremely quickly, suggesting rapid pharmacological blockade of the NK3R receptor. We also were interested to see whether there was a difference in response as to whether the participants received MLE for 901 first or second. And we were able to show that there was no difference in a treatment order. However, there was a, a reduced placebo response if the participants had received MLE for 901 and placebo second than if they'd received placebo first. We wanted to look at other measures of hot flushes, um, not just frequency. And as I say, we looked at um, as early as day three of treatment, but for the purposes of time today, I've just reported the week four data. And again, this is just a point to stop and say that in this study, um, severity and bother were rated individually based on the scale um, that had previously been published and used by Hadeen Joff, whereas the other studies that have been led by the pharmaceutical industry have chosen to uh, define a severity and bother based on the FDA criteria. So making comparisons between the studies is actually very difficult to do for severity and bother, but is much easier to do for hot flush frequency. So again, going back to the MLE for 901 data, hot flush severity reduced by 45% at four weeks of treatment, hot flush bother reduced by 51% at four weeks of treatment, and hot flush interference using the HFRDIS scale reduced by 72% at four weeks of treatment, and hot flush frequency, severity, and bother were all positively correlated. We wanted to make sure that it wasn't just um, information that was being relied on by just subjective reporting. And although our women were extremely involved in the study and extremely attentive with an extremely low dropout rate, uh, well, at a higher dropout rate for other reasons, but an extremely low rate of not following the protocol exactly as uh, requested, we wanted to make sure that we'd also had some objective measurement. And so we were able to do this using this bar conductance, uh, skin conductance monitor is shown on the left-hand side of the screen. And participants wore these on a plaster attached to their sternum, which contains two electrodes for the first two days of every study week. And you can see on the right hand side that this is an algorithm trace print off whereby the hot flush detection software algorithm within the um, device 
identifies where bioimpedance has changed across a predefined uh, algorithmic criteria. And so a hot flush can be identified. So that's all these red crosses that you can see within this trace. And it was extremely interesting to us that when we finished the study and did all the analysis, that there was an almost identical reduction in hot flush frequency, whether you used the measures of subjective reporting with participants measuring and recording their hot flushes real time, or whether we were using objective measurement with this hot flush algorithm software and skin conductance monitor. It was also interesting to look at other menopausal symptoms. Of course, the menopause is associated with a whole host of them, not just vasomotor symptoms, albeit the MS Flash 2 study, of course, suggested that the highest treatment priority for women is um, in hot flushes and sleep. And so looking at the MENQUAL, which is a quality of life um, menopause specific questionnaire, um, which is split into four domains, we were able to show that the vasomotor, psychosocial and physical domain all statistically improved when given a neurokinin-3 receptor antagonist than placebo. Interestingly, though, the sexual domain wasn't significant, and you might expect this as, of course, local vaginal concentrations of estrogen were unchanged. But there were some confounders in our study in that many of the women involved were either widowed or single or not sexually active during the study. But anecdotally, Anecdotally, some of them did suggest that actually they felt more sexually confident or more, had an increased libido when they were taking the drug because their makeup stayed styled on their face, their hair stayed styled after they'd done it, um, rather than it all kind of being ruined by sweating. Um, and they were also able to wear a, a larger variety of clothes rather than feel like they only could ever wear very thin, light things with no sleeves. It also meant, of course, that they weren't quite so hot and bothered. And so they didn't necessarily mind as much being um, um, having kind of close proximity touch with their partners because they just felt less hot and bothered. As I mentioned, the MS Flash um, 2 study suggested that sleep was the second priority for patients. And it was interesting to me to think about whether hot flushes might just get better at night and that might improve your sleep by by um, that mechanism alone, if you're not being um, woken up so much, then maybe you'll sleep better, or whether there's another mechanism behind that. And so we looked at the two items related to sleep in the two questionnaires, uh, the difficulty sleeping item in MenQual and the sleep criteria in the HFRDIS, and we're able to show that there was a significant improvement in sleep um, as measured using both of these two questionnaire items. And there was a linear concordance between these two questionnaire measures. So, of course, I alluded to the fact, and we all know that the menopause is associated with a whole host of symptoms. And so the first thing you might think of is, OK, well, this is great for hot flushes, but is it going to be good for anything else? And actually, it may well be because the neurokinin-3 receptor is actually expressed in many other relevant brain areas, which may be contributing to many of the symptoms that women describe. So for example, women often say that they've got poor concentration, they've got impact on their memory, they feel anxious. Um, and some of these areas such as the hippocampus, the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens, the putamen are all involved um, in some of those brain pathways. Plus, you've also got input from the sleep-wake cycle. You've got input to the prefrontal cortex that's important for concentration. And as we know, the cardiovascular risk increases around the time of the menopause. And this may be important um, in, as suggested by rat studies with spontaneous hypertension. Um, but also, of course, the, a, a, another big thing that um, women complain of is weight gain. And it's the NK3R candy neurons that are important in the estrogen modulation of body weight. Now, of course, any future study is going to have to be powered to all of these outcomes. But it does just start to give you that suggestion that actually the NK3R antagonist may be able to target many of the other symptoms that women um, will report and describe in the menopause that is way beyond just phase motor symptoms. So, as I said, that's the that was predominantly the MLE four nine hundred one study. Well, what's happened with the other with the others? Well, amazingly, despite being done in 
totally different methodological ways, as I said to you, in multi-center versus single center, pharma-sponsored versus um, uh, um, institution-sponsored, um, and three totally uh, chemically distinct compounds, the results are almost the same. So in the first um, proof of concept phase 2A trial of fezolinotans, there were 87 participants randomized to two arms of fezolinotan or placebo. Um, and this was a 12-week intervention in a parallel design, multi-center in Belgium, and showed very similar reduction in hot flush frequency. But as I mentioned to you before, you do need to be careful about how you compare the severity and bother data. In their second phase 2B VESTA trial, this was a dose finding study. So it had eight arms, one of which included placebo. This had 356 women randomized again to a 12 week parallel design intervention. And this was multi-center in the US. Then there's the NT814, which as I um, said to you is a dual neurokinin one, neurokinin three receptor. And the first study published of that was the RELENT-1 trial, which was a multiple ascending dose study with 76 participants, albeit 316 were screened with five different arms, one of which included placebo, which was for a 14 day intervention of which some of the days were included in a clinical research facility, whereas the other studies have been truly ambulatory. And that was multi-center in the US. So therefore, from what I've told you already, achieving approximately a 75% reduction in hot flush frequency, it seems that the NK3R antagonists are almost as efficacious as HRT and certainly superior to the non-hormonal strategies that are otherwise available. So first looking at HRT, you get approximately an 80% reduction in symptoms. And of course, it's difficult to compare the onset time um, with the um, NK3R antagonists as much of the literature reports end of study data rather than early data. But anecdotally, and from our work looking as early as day three, um, these drugs have a very quick onset and offset time. Um, when they are administered. And of course, as Richard alluded to, but we all know there's been a massive reduction in the prescription rates of HRT after many of the um, large studies, um, particularly increasing concern about breast cancer risk. And so for anyone who truly has a contraindication to HRT or still has an aversion to HRT, be it within the public or health professionals, this could be a really exciting treatment option for them. Compared to other options, well, SSRIs will get you about a 40% reduction in your hot flush frequency. CBT similar, but isn't obviously routinely or widely available. And herbal remedies in some of the studies will sometimes get you no better than a placebo. So where is this going now? Well, fezolinotant is now in three at least um, large phase three trials, Skylight 1, Skylight 2, and Skylight 4. Um, and only the top line results so far, um, as you tend to not get a lot of the data published until way after the studies have finished. Um, there are large phase three studies looking at placebo versus two different doses of fezolinotant um, in multi-centers across the US, Canada, and Europe. And then Skylight 4 is the other study that they'll require for FDA um, administration um, and registration, which is to do with looking at just safety data primarily over a 52-week study. As I mentioned, NT814 was owned by Candy Therapeutics um, and has subsequently been bought out by Bayer. So there are two um, large pharmaceutical companies now with one of these compounds each. Um, this is now in the SWITCH1 study, um, which is a phase 2B trial um, and is also ongoing. Uh, this has got four dosing arms in, one, one of which um, uh, an additional placebo arm for a 14-week intervention across 25 centers in the US, Canada and the UK. So of course it's great if they're efficacious, but are they actually safe as well? And looking across the um, studies, there's been no serious adverse events reported in any of the three large trials so far. Um, the adverse events that have been reported have typically been mild and infrequent. There has been a possible signal in a transaminase rise, which has not been deemed to be clinically significant, has never been associated with a bilirubin rise and is 
um, often um, transient and um, rapidly improves with cessation of the drug. But this does need further investigation as to whether this is going to be a class effect. But it might just be like we do with statins or with ACE inhibitors, where you know that you just need LFT or um, use and ease monitoring um, after a treatment has been started. Important from the animal data, um, it's, it's good to know that FSH does not significantly increase as a result of giving an NK3R antagonist. This is particularly important for animal data for bone health, which is obviously important in the menopause, and really importantly for the women who we think that will be able to have this rather than having a contraindication to HRT, using both standard um, lab assays, but also a um, highly sensitive assay, we were able to show that estradiol does not significantly significantly increase as a result of administering an NK3R antagonist. So what does this mean for the near and hopefully nearer, nearer or hopefully near future? Well, treatment with an NK3R antagonist could be practice changing as these have been well tolerated and significantly relieve hot flush symptoms without the need for estrogen exposure by blocking this heightened neurokinin B NK3R signaling. There's been very similar results between the studies, despite um, different methodological approaches, different sponsors, and also um, different chemical compounds within the same drug class. Larger scale studies of longer duration are currently underway in menopausal women, and obviously this has a, a, it highlights the role of big pharma, but the top line results appear promising so far. It's almost certainly going to have a particular role for those with contraindications or aversion to HRT um, and so again this will hopefully start to meet that unmet need. And then my last point would just be to um, remind us all of the importance of basic science in translation because if it wasn't for Naomi Rantz particularly for the last 30 years really looking at the um, neurokinin B pathway um, in hot flushes and also the, the wider aspects of the candy neurons there is no way that we would be sitting here now potentially taking a totally trans transformative um, treatment into clinical practice. So um, a reminder for us all. Thank you very much. Julia, thank you very much for that lovely presentation and uh, current update on the literature. There's just a few questions that have come through on the chat so far. Um, anybody, please, on the Q&A function, please post your questions for, for Julia and Richard. Um, taking this one first, Julia, it says, when does phase three trial start for Fizzalanant? So they're already underway. Um, so that first top line result um, was their first 12 weeks of data. Um, so um, yeah, they're, they're already going. Okay, um, and there's another one I think, which is very, which I think you did answer, but were saying weren't there liver toxicity syndrome symptoms seen in the MLE study and the Sojournex study? And is this a class effect? I think you answered that really. Um, yeah, it's also in the Fesalinitan. It's not quite. Um, uh, Again, it, it's it's difficult to see because obviously we know that not all of the data is being published um, from the pharmaceutical companies, but it definitely does look like um, it will be a class effect. Yeah. Okay, Richard, I want to just ask you a question, actually, if I may, because I, I when you were showing your uh, one of one of your wonderful slides over the different interactions of the of the various receptors, you did talk about a reduction in GnRH. And an effect on testosterone and uh, is was that with the candy peptides as a whole or was that with the neurokinins and would you expect to see that in the neurokinins um that was simply with the uh, one of the neurokinin antagonists and, and in fact there was with the mle drug that that was per, first noticed so actually historically um it's quite interesting um these drugs were actually um first investigated um many years ago for potentially for the treatment of schizophrenia because as julia identified these receptors are actually quite widespread across the frontal cortex and various other centers of the brain that are involved in that and uh, um, one of the side effects that they uh, noticed was that male schizophrenics who took this drug had a very substantial drop in their testosterone level. And of course, at the time, that was an unexpected and unwanted side effect. 
Um, but they didn't work for schizophrenia anyway, so it was dropped. Um, but I do remember actually, I was, uh, in, in, you know, AstraZeneca showed me some of their data from gosh, you know, 25 years ago um, when this was going on, saying, look what's going on here. And, and of course, that was, uh, that, uh, it was uh, uh, a finding we did, were unable to adequately interpret at the time. But yeah, so these drugs do suppress GnRH secretion. Um, as Gia said, they, they don't really seem to have much an effect on the endocrinology in the postmenopause. Um, you, you know, you, you, you see quite dramatic suppression of gonadotropins uh, in men and in premenopausal women, but the whole system is so sort of revved up in postmenopausal women, you don't see much of an effect, at least within the timescales that people have looked at it so far. And it may be with longer effects, longer treatment, then you might see that. But as, as Julia said, um, I, I can't see that being of huge clinical effect in, uh, in, those, in, the, in the normal clinical circumstances you'd be using these drugs. So I think also just to come back um, to your question as well, if you give uh, a kiss, if you give kispeptin or a, a, a kispeptin um, analog, then you'll actually get increased um, secretion um, of GnRH and, and LH until you get tachyphylaxis, and then it will drop, um, and and you will have um, a suppression of of gonadotrophins. Um, so did you see any changes in testosterone in your studies you looked at or did you not look at that testosterone? So we didn't measure testosterone in women um, and our study was um, just in women um, at that stage. Um, it's interesting, um, Richard put up the CASPER paper um, because that was one of the basis of me um, wanting to explore that um, in a bit more detail using kind of more modern assays um, and mathematical modeling because we, I wasn't necessarily seeing the same kind of associated synchronicity um, in all of the participants as um, the Casper and Tatarin paper from the same year suggest. And so we found that in some participants, um, there was quite a tight syn synchronicity between LH secretion and onset of the flush. And then in other participants, there was very little correlation between the onset of the LH pulse um, and um, onset of the hot flush. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question, a few questions coming in now. So the, uh, is there any, some of these fairly short, I think, answers, is there any contraindication to the use of NK3 antagonists? Certainly, if you've a pre-existing history of liver disease, um, for what we know so far, I think it would probably be best to avoid. Um, in terms of what it will be able to be licensed for, um, we'll have to wait and see um, but okay um, so this question really follows on from that it says uh, with the switch study completed uh, when will the um, when will the Elinazat have a phase three study in the US I don't Richard. know <laughs> Uh, yeah, don't know about that one. I mean, you know, I think that's what Julia alluded to, actually, is one of the problems at this stage is when these 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 become seriously, um, you know, not not secret, but th these are very high stakes games, of course, when companies enter phase three trials, vast amounts of money at stake and potentially, you know, very, very important. So getting getting the full details, unless you're actually involved, is 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 pretty impossible oh, you're not going to say <laughs> well i personally i've never had any involvement with any of the come with with a stellus or anything like that so i i have zero no more knowledge than than the next person in the street on that drug i i guess the sort of next general question is best guess given that phase three trials are underway is when do you think these drugs might be somewhere in the world available in the marketplace well, I think it will be soon. And I think uh, it is, you know, Astellas have been moving with this extraordinarily rapidly. And it's really amazing to see how just, you know, you know, it seems like almost yesterday that we were doing phase one studies or seeing phase one studies with these drugs. Uh, and now they've got multiple phase three out there. Um, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And um, I'm sure that it won't be very long before um, that we, that we, uh, some people in the world will be able to be prescribed them. I must just From what uh, I know, I think they're planning late 2023, early 2024. Okay, fantastic. Um, just to like to say uh, hello to Dr. Professor Sanu Dali from Kathmandu, who's posting on the thing saying, welcome, uh, congratulations from Kathmandu. So no, nice to have you on the call. Um, any data, Julia, on the combination of hormone therapy and NK3 antagonism as a treatment for hot flushes? <laughs> 
Yeah, so this was, someone asked me this question at, at, um, at the British Menopause Society conference last week and wasn't really something that I'd particularly thought of um, before. It's, it's an interesting thought because um, as far as I know, there hasn't been combinations, um, partly because as Richard just said, the pharma companies are so keen to get moving forward with this. Um, and obviously we're happy for that too, because it will bring a treatment to our patients quicker that I don't think they're thinking about combinations. Um, and there certainly hasn't been a, a direct head to head study yet. Um, in my mind, as an endocrinologist, if you've got saturation of blockade, I don't see how you're going to have a benefit of having both. I know Richard having us both been in a panel session last week thinks of it differently um I can see I've reflected on it since and I certainly can see how if you can't increase the dose of HRT because you're having breakthrough bleeding or some other unpleasant side effect then you might gain in addition by having an NK3R antagonist but then I just kind of think well why don't you just have an NK3R antagonist um so I, I don't think we know yet, but it's an interesting question. Okay. So I would take a slightly different, and I, 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 I agree with Julia's taking the, the intellectual viewpoint here, but I think possibly the biological reality might be different because you know women don't get hot flushes before the menopause. It is solely when their ovaries stop working that this happens. And yet replacing estrogen or estrogen plus progesterone does not cause complete resolution of this in everybody or in, in a lot of patients and they continue to be ongoing. So I think there may well be, it will be a very interesting area to explore um, whether um, particularly in, with enthusiasm to minimize estrogen replacements where a low dose estrogen plus some neurokine antagonism might be a better symptomatic relief than either drug in, in a more maximal effect. And again, I guess that goes back um, to the, the liver function test, you know, it's about safety with both drugs. If you reduce the dose of both, then you might have a safer combination than a higher dose of either. I, I agree, except the liver point. So there was no, uh, looking at the pharmacodynamics, there were, a lower dose was no, no less likely to um, cause impact on the liver. It seemed to be a rather odd idiosyncratic type reaction. Um, so sadly, because we hoped that a lower dose might be better, but actually... It, that yes, may not ring true. Time will tell with that really when more it's out more widely available and the phase three studies are out. Um, just a quick a question here, following on from the obviously impact, Julie, you you highlighted this uh, drug has effects on more than just hot flushes. So any any antagonistic effect on BMD? Um, yeah, so um, less so. So I don't think the NK3R and uh, receptor is particularly in bone. Um, it's in the gut, and interestingly, fezolinitan had far more gastrointestinal side effects than Emily for 901 did. Um, again, all of those, I think the, the big pharma studies have looked more at bone health though than we did. Um, so again, if that data ever gets published, then we will know a bit more about it. Okay. The, the other aspect actually is the non-reproductive bits that you mentioned, Julie, which I think is very interesting, is, is the weight issue. Yeah. Um, and that has, there aren't a lot of, you know, there are no robust clinical data on that available, but actually I was involved in a study that was just um, published led by Kirsty Walters, where in a, in a rodent PCOS model, the, we did actually see significant weight loss and loss of fat mass out of, out of several of the um, body's fat pads of the, in those animals. So, so in, intriguing potential metabolic effects that might be potential open to, to therapy. Yeah, and that early evidence so far has come exactly, as you say, from um, uh, rodent studies and led and published by um, uh, uh, by Fraser um, and published at Endo as in abstract form at Endo for a couple of years running. Okay, thank you. Um, now, this is another question. Uh, Sorry? Uh, Once again, no full publication. <laughs> You said it. <laughs> um, question from Nancy Ream, which I think lends itself into a wider question. Let's start off with you, Richard. Um, we know that about 10% of women do not experience significant hot flushes during menopause. Are there any genetic data on the candy receptor mutations in these individuals? And I think conversely, we see women who have terrible hot flushes and don't respond to estrogen, and perhaps they have some um, genetic difference that makes them uh, more susceptible to it. I, I, are there any data on how we can identify these people? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that's very intriguing. I'm, and I'm sure that those data will come, but I'm not aware of it yet. So in my talk, I did allude to the, the one piece of genetic data that is relevant to this is that there are variations in the neurokinin receptor that correlates with um, experience of hot flushes. So there may de definitely be individuals who, who don't get hot flushes um, you know, on the basis of genetics. But it, it is intriguing. I mean, I think it just highlights how little we know about the basis of this, because it's also um, a fairly common finding that very young women who go through premature ovarian insufficiency at an early age um, and are very estrogen deficient don't get the, the same side effects with hot flushes as do um, older women. So, you know, again, that's, you know, a, a benefit, but it's another area where I think we just haven't really understood this, this compensatory hypertrophy and the developmental processes that go into to what happens before that. So um, plenty of genetics that can be done there, I'm sure. And I guess this is an area which hasn't really attracted the market, but once you start getting big pharma um, selling, you know, vast new amounts of new drugs, then that spills off into a whole lot of research in the field and is, 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 is for everyone's benefit, which is actually quite an exciting side effect. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, I think the other, th another question along that line previously that came up was that there was a, a question about um, would this drug be useful for women who are getting or people who are getting hot flushes for on cancer treatment so in other words not generated by the menopause or the prostatic treatment that men go through but i mean women who get hot or people who get hot flushes for other uh, side effects of, of other drugs because that's quite a sure. common thing yeah, in definitely i mean i think that the breast cancer community is one that's absolutely top of the list and this is potential beneficiaries excellent okay thank you um uh, so slightly longer question here. This has got a bit of technical detail in it, so bear with me. Uh, thank you. Lots of thank yous, by the way, for the excellent speakers. Um, Bayer has phase one clinical trials for NT814, now BA1342708. Oh, they're looking at PK of rostafatin taken with elanzivit and another study examining reduced hepatic function and the elanzinat dose. Can you comment? Um, that might be... Uh, and then again, when will you see a US approved? I'm not sure that's data that you'll be you either would know about or share, but um, any comment? I know. Richard. <laughs> no. I don't know anything about that, uh, what, what Bayer are planning to do in that regard, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, in all honesty, I can't comment on that. Okay, so uh, Steve Goldstein's uh, IMS president. In the US, the FDA will put in uh, uh, AEs that are greater than placebo, even though not statistically significant into the label. And this becomes the patients what they hear. So what non-severe AEs do show up in the established studies published so far? So anything that has been picked up that would be probably mentioned, even though it may not be significant? Headache, really? though, no. Final, didn't you, Julia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so... Um... Headache, though probably no more than placebo. Um, definitely with fesalinitan, some kind of mild uh, kind of GI type upset. The liver stuff will definitely go in there. Um, otherwise, pretty innocuous. I think the only other one that I mention is with the um, the the the, snap, the NT814, the now the Bayer company uh, compounds. That also seems to cause um, somnolence in um, some women, and particularly at larger doses. Uh, and that may well be a, a direct pharmacological effect rather than the sort of, a, an, you know, a, an, an off target effect related to, um, you know, this pathways role in the frontal cortex. And, and of course, they, they would like to argue that that might be a benefit yeah. if you take it at night <laughs> instead of helping you have a good night's sleep. I was about to say that because I think that's what was said in the in the a few years ago was that that was the hope that that's how it would have a USP above um, an NK3 so yeah. um antagonist so there's another question on that as well related to the sort of substance p pharmacology because this is so this is the nk1 receptor which is the receptor for the substance p um and i mentioned in my talk that this also causes hot flushes you know data going back to the 80s um and certainly there are uh, if you inject substance p into people you will get a rise in gonadotropin secretion as well so it's definitely involved in this pathway it's part of this candy neuron network but i think that um while, while it's certainly very intriguing i think we couldn't say there are clear data that showing that blockade of that pathway is more important in humans it definitely is in rodents but i think it's not clear in humans as to whether that really actually has um, demonstrable advantages as yet
And also in humans, the, the predominant neurokinin is three, whereas in um, rodents, it's two. Um, so that's another kind of big difference and an important thing to remember when you are doing cross species studies because of course they're not quite the same i think the other point i would just make when we're talking about the fda and the pharma companies and how they will have to do certain things for the fda as i mentioned of course they the pharma companies have chosen to use um, the definitions um, of severity and bother for the fda um, but also it's meant that groups of patients who richard and i clearly identify as being absolute candidates for these medications have not been able to be involved in trials because they only want to give their medication to healthy volunteers who are clean and not who are dirty um, because they they do not want anything that will impact on their FDA applications and in a way that's a good thing for some of our patients but you know there is a huge unmet need for patients who would really benefit from this treatment and that is just not a priority for the pharma companies at the moment because they are chasing money if, it, if they if, if things were to go wrong and the drug gets dropped then it's not benefiting anyone so yeah absolutely absolutely unfortunately absolutely. it's the way it has to be but yeah. i guess that's the same in all drug trials isn't it and and ultimately the real proof isn't until it comes out onto the wider market and then we start seeing whether or not there's significant side effects or sometimes even benefits you weren't expecting yeah sure. so, and, and, and also the cost that it comes out at because if they okay. if they put it out a ridiculous cost that's fine in the in the u.s but it's not going to help our patients in lower income countries or in um, public health systems. So yes, of course, they want to recover all the money that they've put in um, from, um, you know, getting it to this stage, but equally it does need to be accessible to the patients that it was supposed to be um, brought to market for. Um, quick question for you, Julia, uh, or maybe Richard, uh, any clinical trials ongoing, which compare NK3 with HRT? I don't know of a head-to-head -head study yet, no. I think so just a, the, the other some note of caution here, of course, is that these studies are all of relatively short duration. Mm -hmm. And you know, um what what we what we don't know, I and mean, you know, there's 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 evidence that of sort of recovery effectively in these trials, i.e. hot flushes go back to where they were beforehand when women stopped taking them. Um, so, you know, we don't know of any particularly long term benefit or whether after a period of time, maybe taking them for, you know, six months, a year, whether the efficacy wears off or whether it's maintained um, and, and what the long term issues are with that. So, you know, the, I think we need to remember that these are still relatively early days. So I've got a, a couple of questions here, which I, we're just running a bit short of time now. So I'm just going to finish off with a few questions. An interesting question here about whether uh, it'd be possible to treat women uh, with pheochromocytoma with NK3 antagonists, especially those over aged over 60. I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> Alpha blockade all the way, please. <laughs> I, I think that's right. okay. um, and there's a couple of questions coming through on endometrium and in effect i think there's the possibility that there may be some slight increase in estrogen i know you didn't report any in your study but some questions about whether you might need it might be acting like an unopposed estrogen and need endometrial protection do we need endometrial do the fda require endometrial biopsies so the fezzolinotan study has included endometrial biopsies and the basis for that is because of theoretical risk I think the basis for that is that the um, FDA see anything that's due to the treatment of postmenopausal women and they think they have to do an endometrial biopsy because they don't distinguish between hormonal and non-hormonal treatment, to be honest. And, and um, it was also requested, I think, in the NT814 study. Um, and the company said, actually, this is irrelevant. We're not going to do it. And the FDA accepted that, as, as I understand things. So I think it's just one of these sort of rubber stamps that they come up with rather than having any real biological basis. Because, you know, these drugs, if anything, suppress the reproductive system. They don't increase it. Um, so, you know, there's, you know, you would not expect an increase in endometrial stimulation um, per, through estrogen. Obviously, no one in the FDA has had an endometrial biopsy. <laughs> well, they are mostly male, I suspect. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're just... Uh, one more question here. Uh, what was this? Why was the Sojournex, Sojournex drug study stopped, and was it due to safety issues? Um, I, I think that information is largely not particularly out there, but I understand that, yes, it was largely due to safety issues. 
Okay. I, th- I think also, I mean, I don't know, but I think also if you look at the impact of on Melendo Therapeutics, they knew once Estellas was there as a massive global player, they were going to find it very hard to pitch against them. So I think if if you're also a relatively smaller company um, versus two now extremely large uh, global pharmaceutical companies it's going to be very difficult to survive in that market and it costs so much to bring a drug to market that if they don't have a USP um, they are much more likely to terminate early. Yeah uh, and uh, I think that's interesting it's a fantastic insight into this new drug and all the sort of options it might have in the future but it's also an interesting insight into the pharmaceutical world I think for those of us who aren't directly involved with it so uh, thank you for sharing your your thoughts. I think we're we're just about sort of out of time now so I just want to conclude by thanking both our speakers very much for excellent presentations plenty of comments in the quick Q&A's about thank you and for excellent presentations so thank you both very much and thank you to all those people who've been on the call well over 300 people have been attending and uh, thank you to all of those who've posted questions so with that uh, I think I'll close the session and say thank you all very much indeed Goodbye. Well, thank you the audience thanks uh, and I'd like to just finish off by giving you a uh, IMS meeting for next 2022.